Gupta period in the middle of the 6th century AD, the political history of India reared around a few important dynasties. The lesser political units did not usually come to the fore during this time. Samudra Gupta's Allahabad inscription refers to the existence of such units which lay submerged under the regional and pan-Indian units of the pre-Gupta and Gupta periods. As Professor Dilip Chakravarti points out, these multitude of political formations dominate attention in various areas in the post-Gupta context. At times, these dynasties struggling for supremacy in both the North and the South. In the North, the feudatories of the Guptas carved out new fortunes for themselves, the two most prominent dynasties being the later Guptas of Maghad and the Mokharis of Kanauj. In the South, we hear of the Vakatakas and the Chalukyas of Badami, which were never, however, a part of the Gupta Empire. The Metrikas of Vallabhi and the Pushyabhutis of Thaneswar were to rise to eminence towards the end of this period, which is now commonly known as Early India. We start a discussion with the later Guptas of Maghad, who were a very well-known dynasty in Northern India during this period. We will first look into their political achievements and also see how they managed to acquire for themselves a position of hegemony in Northern India during this period. The intermediary period between the fall of the imperial Guptas, the Huna invasions and the rise of Harsha in 7th century AD saw the rise of a number of powerful kingdoms in northern India. These were the later Guptas of Magadha, the Maukharis of Kanauj, the Pushyabhutis of Thaneshwar and the Maitrakas of Vallabhi. Now, for our sources of information regarding a study of these kingdoms, we have various epigraphic inscriptions like the Afsa inscription of Gaya, the Deorkar inscription, plus we also have references to these powers, these power struggles that ensued among them in Bana's Harsha Charita and Kadambari. Now, with regard to the later Guptas of Magad, the first question that arises in our mind is, did the later Guptas of Magad really have any familial link with the imperial Guptas? In other words, were the later Guptas really descendants of the imperial Guptas? Now, the names Kumara Gupta and Deva Gupta occurring in both these ruling houses might suggest that the later Guptas of Magad were probably direct descendants of the imperial Guptas. But on the other hand, we have uh, other theories which prove just the opposite. For example, the panegyrists of the descendants of Kumara Gupta never mention that there was any link between them, that is the later Guptas of Magadha and the imperial Guptas. Certainly, these writers who were constantly trying to eulogize their patrons would obviously mention such a matter if it did exist they would certainly try to connect them or link them to, this, to their illustrious ancestry, but they do not do so. 
So, all these theories, all these conjectures point to one thing that in all probability the later Guptas of Magadh was an independent dynasty. It probably had some indirect connection with a smaller branch of the imperial Guptas, but it had an independent existence of its own and it was an independent ruling house. And in all probability again, the later Guptas of Magadha had been the feudatories of the earlier imperial Guptas. And they asserted their independence during the period of political turmoil that set in after the Huna invasions. They tried to carve out an independent political niche, an independent political entity of their own during the 6th century AD. So, this is the conclusion that we can arrive at. Now, the various epigraphic inscriptions mention that there were about 10 or 11 rulers in all belonging to the later Gupta dynasty of Magadh. The founder of the later Gupta dynasty was, however, a person called Krishna Gupta, and he uh, was probably not a very important ruler because we hardly find any detailed account of his activities. The ruler who first becomes prominent in this dynasty was Kumara Gupta III. And Kumara Gupta III, during his reign, we find that there was the emergence of new power conflicts in northern India. And lot of newly risen powers, newly emergent political powers, they were now coming into rivalries with each other and Kumara Gupta III was caught in this vortex. In the first place, we have the name of the Gauras of Bengal. Now, the Gauras of Western Bengal so far had remained on the periphery. They had not shown any interest in mainstream politics of northern India. They lived on the territory, on the sea coast, and they had very little interest in North Indian politics. But suddenly, the Gauras of West Bengal were drawn into this power struggle. Secondly, there were the Andhras. The Andhras, especially under their great ruler Madhava Varman, Madhava Varman of the Vishnu Kundin dynasty. The Andhras were also similarly drawn into this vortex of power politics. Thirdly, we have a mention of the Sulikas. Now, who were the Sulikas? The Sulikas have been identified with the more uh, famous name as the Chalukyas. The Sulikas were none else but the Chalukyas. So, thirdly, we have the Chalukyas. And lastly or fourthly, we have another very new emerging power in the region of Kanauj in the upper Ganges Valley. They were the Maukharis. So, these were the four powers that were becoming very important from the time of Kumara Gupta III, the Gauras of Bengal, the Andhras under their powerful leader Madhava Varman, the Maukharis of Kanauj in the upper Gangetic uh, Valley. And one must remember that this was a very fertile region from the agricultural point of view. Not only was it important from the point of view of agriculture, but it had some very important connecting trade routes. So, economically this was a very important region and the Maukharis had come to dominate this region. So, this was the entire Gupta period, the entire later Gupta period that is spanning from the 6th to the 7th century. And apart from the fact that this period saw the emergence of great power conflict among these various emerging kingdoms, we also notice that this was a period when agriculture really flourished. Economically, this was a very prosperous period. It did not see the decline of trade. Uh, North India did not witness the decline of trade in the post 
uh, imperial Gupta period? No. And there was enough evidence to show that um, there was very intensive trade connection between say for example Persia and India, a fact that has been researched by historian Champaka Lakshmi and she categorically states that there was some connection between Persia and India on the economic front. Another thing to remember about this period is that for the first time two powers from eastern India that is Kamarupa which is can be roughly corresponding uh, with Assam now Kamarupa and Gora of West Bengal, these were for the first time uh, moving gradually into central politics. They had for so long remained on the periphery, right? And uh, Gora, it commanded important rivers and gradually uh, it was beginning to be realized by the rulers of Gaura as well as Kamarupa that the upper Gangetic Valley was a very rich area, was a very fertile area. So there was a gradual a desire on the part of these uh, rulers to establish their sway over this region because economically that was a very fertile region. So what conclusion can we arrive at? That the these two powers no longer remained on the periphery, they were gradually moving into center and a political rivalry was gradually beginning for the possession of the upper Gangetic Valley and there was a shift of the peripheral power to the core area. The Mokharis were a very ancient dynasty of northern India and one finds mention of this dynasty as early as the 5th century BC in Panini's grammar and also in Patanjali's Mahabhashya which was composed in the 2nd century BC. The Mokharis of Kanauj were originally the feudatory generals in Magadh and Rajputana. They claimed their descent from the epic hero Ashwapati. Now this was possibly an indirect allusion to the fact that their original profession was cavalry officers or cavalry soldiers. Hence the use of the name Ashwapati or Lord of the Horse. Now the first important Maukhari king was Ishana Varman who held the imperial title Maharaja Dhiraja. This is significant because it indicated an imperial ambition in them which was probably not present in the policies of the later Guptas of Magadha. Now from a record dating 554 AD, we know that Ishana Varman won a number of victories, victories over the Andhras, the Sulikas or the Chalukyas and the Gauras. Now apart from Ishana Varman, we also come across the names of three other Maukhari rulers. They were Sara Varman, Avanti Varman and Groha Varman. Groha Varman was killed in an ensuing battle between Deva Gupta and the Maukharis and his widowed uh, widow Rajeshri was now put in the prison of Kanauj. However, the death of Groho Varman was avenged by his brother-in-law Rajyavardhan. But eventually the rulers of Thaneshwar, that is the Pushyabhuti rulers of Thaneshwar and the Maukharis were outwitted and defeated by King Shashanka, the king of Gaura. Not much is known about the cultural activities of the Maukhari rulers. We do know that there was large agricultural expansion during this entire period. There was agricultural surplus and the most important factor that emerges is that the importance of Kanauj as a prime location in the middle Ganga valley was gradually being realized by the rulers of northern and eastern India. That was the net result of the Maukhari rule over Kanauj during this period. 
For nearly a hundred years, the Vakatakas, with their capital, Anandivardhan, ensured peace and tranquility over central India and also re-established the orthodox social structure which had suffered considerable battering at the hands of the Kushanas and the Yavanas. Even before the Guptas had established themselves as a power to reckon with in northern India based at Pataliputra, the Vakatakas had already established themselves in what is now known as the Deccan region south of the Narmada and gave peace and consolidation of power and authority in that region for almost 200 years. There were two dynasties or two branches of the Vakatakas and together they ruled over the Trans-Narmada region for 200 years. It was normally believed that the Vakatakas were a northern dynasty as the Puranas had mentioned it and K.P. Jaiswal also uh, formulated that they ruled at a place called Vakataka but no such place had been discovered as yet and the first time the word Vakataka appears was on a 3rd century AD pillar found at Amravati. There are some distinctive marks which help us to understand that the Vakatakas were not a northern power because unlike the Guptas, they did not issue any coins. Our information on the Vakatakas is based mostly on epigraphic sources. One school of historians believe that the Vakatakas were Brahmin in origin and that their Gotra name was Vishnu Bridhi. According to the Basim plates, a Vakataka king was known as Gautami Putra and that induces us to believe that the Vakatakas were a Brahman origin. The formal establishment of Vakataka power was sometime between 284 and 265 AD and the first known ruler of the dynasty was Vinda Shakti. According to the inscriptions, Vinda Shakti performed the Vedic sacrifices which was the prevailing tradition of the times. He was succeeded by his son Pravarasena. Pravarasena it, it can be said was the real founder of the dynasty. While Vinda Shakti ruled for around 25 years, Pravarasena had a long reign of 60 years and Pravarasena made a number of conquests. The next important king is Rudrasena I who was who ruled around uh, 400 or even earlier than that, little earlier than that and he was a contemporary of Samudra Gupta. The Vakatakas who had already been a power to reckon with because of the alliance with the Varashiva Naga dynasty. Pravarasena took a wife from the Varashiva Naga dynasty. It is also believed that the Vakatakas had entered into matrimonial alliances with the Kadambas of Vanavasi. So they were a, an established power and the Gupta king Samudra Gupta understood that the Vakatakas would be a very useful ally in his designs against the Shakas. The next king of the dynasty who had close relation with the Guptas was Rudrasena II. Rudrasena II was married to Chandragupta Vikramaditya's daughter Prabhavati Gupta. As it so happened that Rudrasena died young and Prabhavati Gupta she became the regent and it was through her that the Gupta influence was consolidated on the Vakataka realm but it must be remembered that the Vakatakas never really gave up their identity and there were many areas where the Guptas had uh, been influenced by the Vakatakas. The Vakatakas definitely made a bit for imperialism but imperialism el eluded them. We can say the Vakatakas were not as powerful as the Guptas or as creative as the Guptas but they have a number of cultural claims to make and we must say that although they, they predate the Guptas perhaps but they emulated their Gupta imperial allies in many of their activities. 
The Wakatakas were also patrons of art, patrons of literature and many of their kings like the Gupta kings were also adept both in the Shastra and the Shastra that is the weapons and the scriptures. And we find that Vakataka kings, they, uh, they, they composed poetical works like Pravara uh, Sena too. He was famous for Setu Bandha and Setu Bandha had been very highly acclaimed by many like authors like Dandin. It has also been said that Kalidasa spent a very significant part of his career in the Vakataka court that he composed his Megha Duta in the Vakataka court. The Vakatakas were not just the imitators of the uh, Guptas, they have made architectural contributions in the temples constructed at Tigawa and Nachna and the Tigawa uh, uh, pillared hall of Tigawa, it represents an adaptation of the Indo persepolis style and the caves of Ajanta, some of the caves of Ajanta were also uh, decorated with paintings and decorated with great uh, images of the Buddha in the Dharma Chakra Pravartana Mudra, for instance in one of the caves, cave number 16, 17, 19 and 21, definitely date to the Vakataka times and it is because of this great uh, achievements of the Vakatakas in literature, in architecture that Ramesh Chandra Mojumdar and A.S. Altekar, they would like to describe the age as a Vakataka Gupta age. So we find the Vakatakas were not just a bridge kingdom, they were not just the transmitters of the Gupta culture, but they had their own contributions to make and definitely they emulated their Gupta contemporaries their Gupta allies in many ways that there was a Brahmanization of the region which came with the gradual uh, presentization of the tribes, the uh, expansion of the agricultural work. Definitely there was this Brahmanical influence but we must say that Prakrit or the regional culture was also assimilated during the Vakataka raid. While the Vakatakas ensured peace and prosperity over central India, their contemporaries in the Deccan were the imperial Chalukyas of Badami. For about two centuries, extending from the middle of the 6th century to the middle of the 8th century, the Chalukyas ruled over extensive regions in the Deccan. They were the earliest of the various branches of this dynasty. In the first quarter of the 7th century AD, Pulakesin II founded the Eastern Chalukya dynasty at Pishtapura. The Chalukyas of Vimulvada were initially the feudatories of the Rashtrakutas, uh, but they later became independent. The Rashtrakutas were finally overthrown by the Western Chalukyas in 973 AD. From about the middle of the 6th to the middle of the 8th century, an extensive area of the Deccan were under the Chalukyas of Padami, the other branches being the Chalukyas of Vengi, the Chalukyas of Vemulwar who were the feudatories of the Rashtrakutas and the later Chalukyas of Kollani who overthrew the Rashtrakutas in 973 AD. Sources for this study include inscriptions engraved on stone slabs, pillars and copper plates. There is little room for doubt that the Chalukas were an indigenous Canaries family and they claim to be of Khatriya origin. Swan Sang re refers to Polokisin as Khatriya by birth. They have been variously identified with the Gujaras, the Chulika people of Uttarapatha, the Sogdians, the Shulkis of the Haraha inscriptions who have been identified with the Shulkis of Urissa. The Chalukyas, moreover, have claimed that they are Haritiputtas of the Manabha Gotra. Their family god was Vishnu, but we know that they patronized uh, Jain and Shaiva sects, and some of them also adopted the religion. 
the first important ruler of the family was Pulokesin I. His dates are 535 to 66 AD. He was the first Maharaja of the family and may be considered as the real founder. He fortified the hill of Badami into a strong fortress in 543-4 AD. One of the first exploits of Pulokesin was the overthrow of the Kadambas from the capital Vanavasi. Then the Alupas of South Kanara and the Gongas of Mysore were forced to surrender. The Gongo king Durbinito gave his daughter in marriage to Pulokesin and he, she became the mother of the next king Vikramaditta I. The Mojos of North Konkan were once again forced to submit by an attack on the capital at Puri which has been referred to as the Lokki of the Western Ocean. The fame of Pulokesin's arms and fame of his arms and uh, the news of Harsha's growing power induced the Latos, the Malavas and the Gongos to offer their submission. And in this way, Pulokesin's boundary in the north extended to the river Mahi. Now, when Harsha sought to invade the Deccan, Pulokesin met him on the bank of the Narmada and defeated him. This was the first time that the mighty northern emperor was defeated in the hands of a southern enemy. The Chalukkas are known to have been great patrons of art and architecture. While formerly scholars were of the opinion that they just imitated the Pallava style, but now it has been recognized that they had a unique creative style of, of their own. Badami, the royal seat of the Chalukyas, contains a number of shrines which are both excavated and structural and are of singular interest for architectural details. More important are the three caves excavated at Badami. They are beautiful cave temples. Though the facade is very plain, the interior is renowned for the architectural designs and sculptures. In the interior, we find pillars of various designs and a profusion of sculptures and carvings. It has been claimed that the Chalukas were sculptors were great creators of Hindu iconography. In this connection, we may also mention Jaina caves at Badami and Aihol, both of which appear to have been dated from about the middle of the 7th century AD. Some Buddhist caves were also excavated by the Chalukkas. Besides Aihol, there are temples at Badami and Pottadakal. Vinayaditya built the magnificent temple of Shiva under the name Vijayeshwar at Pattadakal in Badami district. The rivalry between the later Guptas and the Mokharis and the consequent participation of Go and Kamrup in the political race was definitely for the mastery over the most fertile region of the country, the Ganga Valley. The Mokharis fell, but their capital at Kanoj became the most coveted possession for any aspirant of political domination in northern India because of its prime location in the middle Ganga Valley.